Yes. Uh, so for this session, we have joining us uh, Mr. Paul Rose, a National Geographic Explorer. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit about uh, National Geographic and, and Paul's work, and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to hand it over to him to talk about uh, uh, the ocean and, and some of the wildest places. Um, the National Geographic Society uses the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Uh, the future facing us as young people in this world has never been more uncertain. Uh, and as I'm sure you've noticed, large scale youth mobilization has grown to an unprecedented level with young people like many of you calling for action on an array of social, economic, and environmental justice movements. At National Geographic, we are focused on how we can support young people and foster the movements, organizations, and inventions that you're already driving. Right now, we're at a pivotal moment where passionate young people are leading efforts around the world to advance science in amazing ways. Today, you're gonna hear from rock star National Geographic Explorer, a man on the front lines of exploration and one of the world's most experienced science expedition leaders, Paul Rose. Paul helps scientists unlock and communicate global mysteries in the most remote and challenging regions of the planet. As a former vice president of the War Royal Geographical Society, representing field work and expeditions, Paul is an expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas Expeditions. In his work for BBC, Paul presents television programs focused on science and the environment. As a polar guide, Paul has led Greenland ice cap crossings, first ascents of previously unclimbed Arctic mountains, and new ski mountaineering routes. He was the base commander of Rothera Research Station Antarctica for the British Antarctican Survey for 10 years and was awarded the HM the Queen's um, Polar Medal for his work with, uh, excuse me, Polar Medal for his work with NASA in the Mars Lander Project on uh, Mount Urbis, Antarctica. He was awarded the US Polar Medal. Um, also, uh, there is a mountain in Antarctica named after Paul. So I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him share a little bit about his work and, and what, he's, uh, what he's been up to. And I hope that you are as inspired by it as I have been. Paul? Hey, great. Hello, Andrew. Thanks very much for the, for the warm welcome and introduction. And hello, everybody uh, watching and listening. Um, I'm grateful for being here today because just like you, you know, life has changed and um, I'm not going on expeditions at the moment. So I'm, I'm here at home. So a chance to share, as Andrew described, um, looking underneath the hood, looking behind the scenes of science expeditions and how we do them could be uh, perfect timing. So thank you again for the opportunity to do it. And I'm just going to um, share my screen. And uh, hang on, Andrew, it says here that um, um, I've uh, got my screen sharing disabled. So if you can <laughs> fix that for me, buddy. <laughs> yes, give me one second. Thank you. <laughs> I tell you, we're all learning oh, new skills, aren't we? <laughs> we really are. I, I think it should be go good to go now, Paul. Why don't you give it a try? Thank you, buddy. I'm on. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Andrew. Well, like I say, it's absolutely great to be here. And um, just like everybody on the planet, we're all learning new skills. We're all working virtually. And uh, I've become a bit of a semi-professional Zoomer rather than a professional expedition leader. So this is a great opportunity to share with you some behind the scenes. You know, what's underneath the hood? What is the, the beating heart of science expeditions? And so, um, for me, it's this moment right here. I mean, I'm no scientist. You know, I'm a professional diver and a polar guide, as Andrew says. And my background is, is really engineering and the practical side of life. But what I discovered in my career is scientists need a lot of people like me. It's around about three science support people to every scientist. You know, scientists need, you know, pilots, boat drivers, divers, plumbers, electricians, dentists, cooks, you name it. There's a whole great tribal team 
of science support people. And the, one of the best bits of it for people like me is when I meet a scientist like this, this is the great man, Jeff Severinghouse from Scripps, University of California, San Diego. And I know that photograph's a bit out of focus, but that is one enormous equation. And that's Jeff explaining to me what we're going to do in Greenland to find ancient methane. So of course, the moment of meeting a scientist or a science team and turning that hypothesis, that idea into something that's going to work at the end of the world's longest supply chain for many years in challenging environment is right up my street. I love to take those ideas and turn them into icebreakers and helicopters and airplanes and remote camps and really make it happen. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, uh, way to, to earn a living. I've done it all my life. So it normally starts, here's a, a rough example. It starts, this is in Greenland up at Packetsock on the West Coast. It starts with me getting in early and establishing some kind of camp to live in. Essential supplies, you know, food and fuel and shelter for the team, communications, medical supplies, and a, and a sense of foot in the door we've started. The very next job is to get something going on the science side. And this is our tiny science laboratory on the Greenland ice cap. You can see it's a, a funny angle. It's a very warm part of the Greenland ice cap there. And it's on the move all the time. It's like slow moving, half frozen ocean waves. And I used to spend quite a bit of time every single day keeping that laboratory level. Here's a quick peek inside. And it's a big job for me to keep all the, the power running and all the supplies running so that the gas chromatography in this case can run accurately inside the, um, the, the, the laboratory tent. And you can see that silver tank right there in the center of the picture that's called an Essex cylinder. And that's the thing that we're collecting ancient air in because outside we're digging a groove and that groove, we dig that thing until we've got about 11 and a half tons of ice out of it. And that's the younger driest period. So that's 11,000 years old, the last glacial period. We take that ice, put it in the melter, which is the thing you can see covered with a blue box because we don't want to get it too warm put all the ice in there, melt it off under a vac drawing it down into a vacuum and collect all the ancient air and put it in that Essex cylinder. And from that, Jeff and his team can tell where the methane came from at the last glacial period. You know, was it methane clathrates? Was it swamps? Or indeed, was it animals? So this, you know, on one side, we've got the, the big plan. And then there's the whole logistics of getting it to happen and then back to the science side to make those results really work. Similarly in Antarctica, my job is to get the camp set up first. This is my camp on the Taylor Glacier where I worked for a number of years. It's one of the most beautiful camps you can possibly imagine because it looks just like a very old famous Antarctic watercolor painting. And it's a great feeling to wake up every morning feeling that I'm in an old historical watercolor painting. So once we've got camp set up, uh, my tent, by the way, is the second yellow one from the, the right hand side. So get camp set up. Then my job was to get all of the power going. And in a, on a small situation like this, the smart thing is to have lots of small generators with each generator running a particular piece of science equipment. It gives us a lot of redundancy. You might notice that the fuel in those orange drums the generators uh, on, in the car, on the wooden boxes are all in like a plastic tray. And that's because we can't afford to drop one single drop of fuel or oil on that glacier. We've got to keep it absolutely pristine. Um, so then we get the laboratory tent set up. You can see this is a slightly different one. Um, inside there is all the gas chromatography gear. And on the left, you can see a big wooden structure that's the structure we use to lift the ice cores into the melter. And in the bottom right of the picture, that's the back of my house in England with a prototype uh, rigged up because I was uncertain how I could build a rig that would actually work and yet still fit in the helicopter. So of course it was down to the lumber yard and buy some wood and build it in the garden, measure that up, compare it to what would fit in the helicopter. And, um, and of course it fitted, so there you go. Um, on the bigger projects, uh, we need remote research stations. And 
inarguably that's the most beautiful polar research station on earth because that's my old base called Rothera Research Station in Antarctica. And at the moment we're looking east, north is to the left and the South Pole is angled to the right. And just so you know, it's not a bent runway. Uh, it's one of those long stretched out pictures. So the runway does look a bit bent. The, the runway is a kilometer long, by the way. And early in the season, the first job is to get the base open. So it goes from the lockdown winter mode, the small wintering team, into the full international research station with over 100 people there. So we use the big aircraft up on the top left. That's the Dash 7 that we fly down from Chile and from the Falkland Islands. And the smaller aircraft, the Twin Otters, you can see they're on wheels and skis. They're all set up for going in the deep field and supporting those camps a long way from the base. At the same time, we start the twin ship operation, all the really heavy stuff, food, fuel, big science equipment, all comes in on the ship. And then we move that ashore with uh, helicopters and aircraft to establish remote camps. Usually uh, working in cooperation with other nations, we use the ski equipped Hercules as well. And of course that's a very efficient way of getting a lot of heavy equipment to a very, very remote place. And eventually you can imagine there's this whole network of camps set up all around Antarctica every season. Uh, there might be small ones like this or quite big ones. The one on the top right is mine at the South Pole. And it, I would say in any given year, I would have about 40 uh, expeditions to look after in Antarctica. So in my 10 years as base commander, I must have looked after 400 expeditions. It seems like a lot looking back on it, but um, that's the nature of polar science. I was very lucky, as, as, as Andrew said, to work for NASA on Mount Erebus. And this was an exceptional field season to go back to Mount Erebus. I'd previously worked up there. I'd been on the summit 19 times, so I knew the way. And then NASA, on its plan to um, go to Mars, needed a, a place to test the Mars lander, uh, the robot, that, which they called Dante at that time. So they built a really big one because it was easier to work on a big scale. This is it. They built it at Carnegie Mellon, um, Red Robotics it was called in Pittsburgh, and decided that the single place they could test it in the world was Antarctica because there's a lot of science support near this mountain called Erebus. It's Antarctica's active volcano. So it could descend in the active volcano, do useful research and test its instruments. So it's quite something spending a whole season high on Erebus looking after a robot. But being a diver, as Andrew said, there's something about the water. And for me, it would be the diving, you know, polar diving, I can, I can still remember, I think, nearly every single polar dive I've made. I mean, most of those dives were world's first. There's is an amazing sense of energy diving with one of the world's greatest marine scientists. That's the man standing up there, Lloyd Peck from British Antarctic Survey, coming up from a really exciting dive where we've seen all these amazing things and saying, hey, Lloyd, you know, what was that green thing that looked like that? And what were those worm-like things? And him to say, you know what, Paul? I've got absolutely no idea. Oh, how exciting is that? Plus, on most dives, not on this dive, but on dives when the ice is very solid and very calm and quiet, you can hear whale song. So even if those whales are miles away and you can't see them, you can hear whale song. So I'd be on the bottom getting a core, a sediment core off the bottom or checking the scientific instrument underwater and you couldn't avoid it. You could hear whale song. And once it's under the ice, of course, it echoes and reverberates a long, long way. And, you know, there's a, it's an amazing place to experience um, science support is the Antarctic. Um, but no matter how glamorous and glorious uh, you might think science support is at the moment, there's always the rubbish. And it's typically people like me who are running science support that look after all of the waste. You can see me there with, with a sledge full of waste. I think that's about a week's worth of waste. On the left-hand side of that sledge, is all the things you can imagine, paper, glass, cans, plastic, all that kind of stuff, cardboard. And on the right-hand side, in those uh, gray buckets, a human waste. Um, so all of our P and all of our number twos would also be flown out to keep that region completely pristine. And of course, pristine seas, that's me. Um, thanks again for the great introduction. Um, I am the expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas. Pristine Seas is a project that was invented by Enric Saller who's a National Geographic explorer in residence. 
And he came up with a thing. He was a professor at Scripps. And he said this thing. He said, you know, I suddenly realized that every science paper I wrote was like writing the obituary of the ocean. We knew what was going wrong, but what could we do about it? So he came up with an idea called Pristine Seas. And that was to go and find all of the last wild, truly pristine places in the ocean, explore them and get them protected. So it sounds really simple, but it's hellishly complicated. And Enric put a great team together. And then after a few years running it, as it grew and became more ambitious, uh, he asked me if I would lead the expeditions. And I dropped everything and I've been leading the expeditions ever since. You can see um, we're active, we've had 30 expeditions, we've created, helped to create 22 marine protected areas, and we've protected over 5 million square kilometers of the ocean. We've got a method, um, and the method is a lot of planning. Typically, places get uh, protected by people falling in love with a place, and then working out how to get it protected which of course makes sense. You know, maybe it's a coastal region or it's a jungle region, whatever it might be. But of course, it means that maybe that you haven't done political analysis and you could spend your whole life trying to get this place protected because you don't understand the drivers and the motivators to get it protected politically. So what we do is we run two parallel tracks. We run the science and that's Alan Friedlander, who's our chief scientist and Enric Saller and the rest of our science team putting together the science cases around the world as to what parts should be protected next. And at the same time, we do a big political analysis and see which countries have got the appetite to do it and what the drivers are to make it happen. So we spend a lot of time planning. In fact, this, these three pictures here were us in, in Connecticut uh, back in November, um, pre-COVID-19. And we're there, classic National Geographic. You can see we've got loads of National Geographic maps and a load of sticky bits of paper. And uh, we spent lots of days there and planned out the next 10 years. And of course, COVID-19 has happened, so we've jogged everything back. So I tell you, we're gonna be busy in about the next 10 years. But once we've done all of the planning, we then go to sea. Um, we don't have our own ships, so we charter vessels. This is the James Clark Ross uh, British Antarctic Survey vessel, actually. It was a, a great thrill of, my, thrill of mine to charter this one because I, been working on Antarctic, in the Antarctic on her when she was brand new. So it was a great uh, excitement to go back into Bass headquarters and charter the boat for our Essential Island expedition. And this is us in Recife, um, getting the ship ready to, to, to sail to the Ascension Islands. Sometimes we charter vessels up in the north. Uh, this is us in, um, in, in the Russian Arctic, up at Murmansk. That's our ship on the left. Um, a Russian vessel, and we're loading it with all the equipment to go north into the Russian Arctic for seven weeks. Occasionally, one of our supporters, one of our sponsors, gives us one of their vessel, and this is uh, Ted Waite's vessel, the Plan B. Um, it's quite small, you know. We, it means we can only bring about 10 of our team, which is tricky for us because we normally need at least 14 of us, um, and that's split relatively evenly between the science team the in-country hosts and the media team. Um, and then we use, sometimes use a very small boat, which I have to say is one of my favorites. Although it's our smallest boat uh, called the Argo, it does hold a submarine and it's completely set up for diving. So you come back from a dive or prepare for a dive or get equipment ready or anything. It is a perfect dive boat. And that is in Costa Rica. And that's our team there getting ready to go to sea on her. Eventually, we reach a moment where a bit like Jeff Severinghouse with the huge equation, our chief scientist, Dr. Alan Friedlander, sits us down and tells us how we're going to operate. And that's his great plan. Um, I'm grateful for these incredible simple plans that Alan manages to draw out because it focuses all of our minds. And that tiny island at the top left of the whiteboard is Malpelo, which is in Colombian waters. Um, and you can see going down to the very bottom is, our, is a little thing with two eyes on it. That's our drop camera. Just above it is our submarine. You'll see something there, 50 to 100 meters. It says the twilight zone. Above that, there's a picture of divers. And at the top is the surface. So Alan then sets out our our priorities based on the science plan and of course the media plan. We use two streams. We, we do glorious science reports. I 
I think since uh, Pristine Caesar has been going, we've done 130 uh, published science reports, but we also need compelling media to tell that story. So it's a two string operation on every expedition. So we get this great moment when Alan gathers us all together scientifically. I gather everybody together to tell them how I think we're going to actually make it happen practically. And eventually we get all of the technical side. This is one of our recompression chambers. You see Dave on the left, who's um, our diving officer, uh, testing it with one of our guests in Colombia, actually, Sandra Bescudo on uh, Malpelo. We've also got a small recompression chamber, which is this red tunnel right there that folds up and collapses into these black boxes. So it means everywhere we go, even on a small ship, we can have a recompression chamber. So if a diver has a problem and arrives at the surface with decompression sickness, we don't have to call for a helicopter and get them back. We can treat them on board the vessel. Eventually, after all that equipment is prepared and we know what we're doing, we jump in the sea and we measure everything. Uh, Alan's science team have got a set template that they run everywhere. And it's the same template everywhere. So they can count all the different kinds of fish and all the kinds of life on the bottom, the benthos, so that there's a measurable pattern globally. So this is Alan underwater in classic position, um, sort of being watched at by, by lots of beautiful seals while he's counting fish on his slate. This is Kike, who's uh, Kike Ballesteros, who is the world's uh, greatest uh, algae or seaweed expert. And that's him in typical mode there with his quadrat, that's a one meter uh, square, measuring all of the benthos, all of the life on the bottom. So we're busy underwater. The science team are running back and forth three or four dives a day. The media team are having two or three dives a day. So that Manu San Felix, who heads our underwater uh, film and, and, and uh, fo photo crew, can come back with images like this. You know, compelling images tell big stories, don't they? We need the science report, but we do need those compelling images to tell the powerful stories. Um, sometimes there'll be science images like this one. Sometimes it'll be me. That's me in the Seychelles with a beautiful grouper. And when you're up close and personal to things, it gives us a license to tell big stories because people are paying attention to what we say. It also means that we can take film and images of things like this. This is a beautiful Galapagos shark in French Polynesia with a long line hook in its mouth. And we had heard that the, there was no illegal fishing, but when we can go down and share time with these beautiful Galapagos sharks and not just witness that they have got long line hooks in them, but take film and images of them, we can bring back that powerful and compelling story and say, look, you've got illegal fishing going on in your waters. We can't get all the way to the bottom. We are just scuba divers, we can get to about 50 meters deep. So we use this thing, this is a drop camera. Uh, we've got a whole fleet of these things and they go all the way to full ocean depth. They've been all the way to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and back up again, of course, that's the trick. And inside that dome is a video camera that's running all the time. And underneath it is a heavy weight and some bait. You know, we put, send some fish. It goes all the way down to the bottom, runs for a prescribed amount of time, and then pops and up it comes all the way to the surface again, and we can find it. And in that camera, to give you an idea of how little we know about the oceans, is more than half of the time, there's something brand new on there. It might be a new species, which is amazing, of course, or it could be the first time that a particular species has been recorded in that region. So it shows you how little we do know about the ocean when we can plot that thing in and record such great stuff. Um, it's worth going on to the Pristine Seas website, by the way, looking at some of our films, and hunt out the drop camera images. They're called drop camera images and um, see what you think of them. We also want to try and get deep. So here we are on the Argo with the submarine. That's me being filmed in there by John Betts, our, one of our great cameramen. And it means that we can go in and I can tell big stories about what's happening under the sea. And we can also, in most cases, get that leader of that country Perhaps it's the environment minister, perhaps it's the president, perhaps it's a decision maker, get them into their waters, perhaps for the first time, and they can fall in love with their sea, understand what's down there, and then of course they can protect it. Because as you know, 
you can't protect what you haven't fallen in love with. So this is a wonderful thing when we can get um, a, a decision maker from our host country deep in the submarine or diving with us or snorkeling with us, it makes an enormous difference. So that's me. I, you know, I love working with pristine seas. It's a glorious job. It's a sort of ultimate science support job. And my personal satisfaction comes from moments like this, diving up in the Northwest Passage at the breakout of the sea ice at the start of the spring, diving under the North Pole for BBC, crossing Greenland, that long straight journey. I love that long rhythmic, mind numbing physical grunt for 30 days to get across Greenland in a long straight line. It's a beautiful expedition, I absolutely love it. Or even being in the Arctic and on the last dive of the project, having my dog so pleased to see me that he's bitten me on the head to stop me going in. And I've still got these little, little grooves and dents in my head from that friendly, but very big and sore bite. Camping in these, the world's most beautiful and iconic locations, camping in challenging conditions, camping high on Denali and other cold places, camping in glorious weather in the polar regions, camping at the South Pole, even having your tent blown out or your tent blown away by an active volcano. To me, that's really living and it's called science support. And I very much hope that this view under the hood or behind the scenes has encouraged you to join me in the very same business. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. Wow, some of those images, and I mean, I, they're the, the image with the shark in the, in the long hook in its mouth was just, was just terrible. As we pointed out at the beginning of this session, you know, we depend on the oceans for so much from livelihoods to uh, oxygen. And just thank you so much for all the work that you and your team are doing uh, to protect them. Um, I want to go ahead and pass it off to Dane Weber now to uh, introduce herself and also to uh, uh, run a little bit of a cahoot, which I'll let her explain. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Paul, for that talk. That was amazing. Um, I am Dane Weber. I work at the National Geographic Society on youth engagement and leadership opportunities. I'm very excited to play this Kahoot with all of you. Uh, you're all experts on the ocean, so I think we're going to see some pretty good scores on this game. Uh, if you haven't heard of Kahoot, here are some brief instructions. Today we'll be play playing a five question Kahoot, a Kahoot challenge game. This means that you'll be able to play on your own uh, or follow along with us on screen and guess the answers as you go. So you can play now or you can play again, again later and try and beat your score if you'd like. This challenge will test your accuracy and your speed. So make sure that you're answering quickly and correctly. Sadly, there aren't any prizes today, but make sure your nickname is your first name and your country so we can acknowledge all of the top scorers. Uh, so to play, you can open up a new browser window and go to kahoot.it. Uh, you can click the link that Andrew has dropped into the chat, or you can open up the Kahoot app on a mobile device if you already have it downloaded. Once you're in Kahoot, enter the game pin, which is 02523981. So again, that's kahoot.it, and the Game pin is 02523981. If you were able to click that link that Andrew posted, then you can just uh, you can just click the link and it'll take you right there. You won't have to worry about entering the pin. So if you're not tuning in live and watching this later, you can still play. Just enter that same game pin 02523981 at kahoot.it or on the Kahoot app to play along. Uh, and you can play through next Sunday, June 28th. Okay, let's get started. Share my screen. Oh, I also can't share my screen, Andrew, sorry. Sorry, we're gonna fix that one second. Okay, questions, you can answer some of these questions. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so. You should all be able to see my screen right now, and we're going to get started and play. I'm not going to answer so that you guys have a chance to uh, also play. 
Okay, scientists believe the majority of species living in the ocean are crotists, fungi, animals, or plants. Again, protist, fungi, animals, or plants. If you're playing on your own, you're probably gonna go through this a lot faster than, I, than we are on screen, but we'll, I'll just keep playing uh, slowly so that everybody has a chance to join if you're, not, if you're not playing with the Kahoot. Okay, Sanja is in the lead. Actually, we've got a top, oh no, I'm sorry. Sanja's in the lead without a thousand points and Andrea Q from Mexico has 684. Paul, you missed that that question. I'm a little disappointed. I was I was too late. I said an, I said animals to myself, but I forgot to type it in. Was what 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 animals is right? Is it? Animals is the correct answer. Yes, I'm sorry. God, but but I, but I was too late to type it in. I thought, oh yeah, animals. Then I went, oh, of course you've got to type it in. Yeah, you can if you're on the if you're on the on the device, you can just touch the color that um, okay. whatever uh, color and symbol matches. <laughs> got it. Okay, next question. The largest animal on earth is what ocean mammal? Is it the great white shark, sunfish, whale shark, or blue whale? Okay, is it great white shark, sunfish, whale shark, or blue whale? Okay, the correct answer is blue whale. <laughs> Just making sure I got it right. <laughs> so I'm just still in the lead. Oh, tied with Sam from the UK and Andrea Q from Mexico still in third. Logan and Cody, uh, you are rounding out the top five. <laughs> okay, next question. What sea animal does not have a heart or a brain? Octopus, jellyfish, eel, or porpoise? Click in the blue, but it won't uh, do it. The octopus, jellyfish, eel, or porpoise? Okay, the correct answer is jellyfish. Let's see how you guys did. Oh, Sanja's lost the lead. May from the USA is in the lead. Uh, Sanja, you're still in second place. You've got, you've got, I'm sorry, Sanjana. I've been pronouncing your name incorrectly, I apologize. Uh, Sam from the UK, Shu, new to the leaderboard from the USA. Let's see our next question. It's our fourth of five questions. In what species do the males give birth to their young? Is it tortoise, seahorse, shark, or eel? Again, tortoise, seahorse, shark, or eel? The correct answer is seahorse. Okay, here's our last ocean, or I'm sorry, let's see the leaderboard for the top five, and then we'll go to our last oceans, ocean animals question. May from the USA in the lead with 4,564 points, very good. That's, I think that's almost, uh, almost a perfect score. Sam from the UK, Andrea Q from Mexico, Logan from the USA, and Sanjana rounding out the top five. Okay, last question, everyone ready? Let's go. A group of fish is called a school. A group of trout is more specifically called a, a smack, a platoon, a mob, or a hover. It's probably the hardest of all of them. Is a group of trout called a smack, a platoon, a mob, or a hover? We'll get to see the winners here in just a second. The correct answer is a hover. Might be worth looking, looking that up and seeing, seeing uh, what a group of trout looks like in photos. Uh, Paul, I'm sure you've taken some photos of, or you experienced some photos of groups of trout. <laughs> I have, yes. But, but in, in England, actually. Really? Yeah, That's of all so cool. places. There's a river near our home in England, which is a great place for getting pieces of trout. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so let's see who the winner is. 
May from the USA, good job, 5,964 5, points, that's very good. Cody, Sam from the UK, Sanjana and and Andrea Q from Mexico rounding out the top five. You can go back and play again. You can challenge your friends by sending them this same link um, or sending them the just the challenge pin and telling them to go to kahoot.it. And again, you can play through next Sunday. So keep coming back and try and get a perfect score. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dane. Uh, a group of trout, was it? Is I know. I have so much to learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, thank you so much for uh, facilitating that Kahoot. And for those of you who that was your first time, uh, be ready for many more Kahoots because we at National Geographic love them. Yes, we do. Um, oh yeah, if you want to hear, sorry, Andrew, if you want to hear any more Cahoots or play any more Cahoots, you can just go to um, the Kahoot webpage and search for National Geographic and you can find a wealth of Cahoots on our page. It, we have like 60 or 70. Oh, I, I definitely will be. Thank you so much, Dane. And, and Dane. Paul, um, it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul there, was a, there were a few questions actually that came in uh, while you were presenting, if you wouldn't mind sticking around to answer a couple. Of course. Uh, Emmanuel asks, what advice do you have for young people on how to get involved in conservation work and expeditions? Yeah, I would say, um, obviously, the thing to do is, is, is get through some school, get some basic school education. But you don't need to set the goals high that you, you must go to university and get um, a high degree. If you have a passion for building or a passion for communications or elect electronics or electricity or plumbing or driving vehicles or managing or handling boats, then that can be the open door for you to work in conservation. Because I say scientists need a lot of people just like me. So I would say that if let's say you're people that are at school thinking, wow, Am I going to go to college? Am I going to go to university? Am I going to get an apprenticeship? What am I going to do? Well, you can't go wrong with following your heart. And if, if that person says, well, I'm going to go to university because I love the idea of being there, or I'm going to go to college because I love the idea of being there, or I'm, I've got an affinity to mechanics and I'm going to be the world's greatest mechanic, then follow, follow your heart and there is a job for you in science conservation. Not everybody in the remote places at the front line of science is a scientist. Three times that number are people just like me making the project happen. So it's a big industry. There's always jobs for people that are very enthusiastic and following their own heart to develop their own talents. So follow your talents. And then one quick thing you can do is you can contact me and I'll help steer you on science support work. I do it regularly all the time, so you can email me and I'll help you. Paul, that's such great advice. And I think, you know, for young people that are thinking about uh, what is it, you know, what, what could a career in conservation or environmentalism look like? You know, we're inundated with the classic, um, you know, scientists, PhD, 10 years in school, um, but you're offering up uh, another side of that story, the other pieces of the puzzle that are so important uh, to making these expeditions happen. And I think you might be opening some folks' eyes on this call. And, and what I, you know, it's very generous of you to, to offer up your email address like that. I, I'm sure that there are many people that'll take you up on that. I'm, I'm dead serious. And uh, the actual email address is rosecoms at me.com. That's rose. C O M M S at me.com. Andrew's got it, and I'm happy for Andrew and Dane to pass my email on to you. And um, also on my website, which is paulrose.org, there's a contact page. So if you, if you want to wonder how to get involved in conservation or science at the front line, drop me a line and I'll help. We will drop it in the, in the chat. So we did have another question from Bailey. Um, more of a kind of technical question. So when it comes to diving in some of these more remote places, how cold is the water? Because, you know, <laughs> you mentioned, you know, oh, beautiful day for camping in the Arctic. But what is a beautiful day in the Arctic? Well, it's cold. You're dead right, Andrew. I mean, our, when we're diving, the water is minus one 
or minus two, which sounds crazy because theoretically then it should be frozen, right? Because minus one C is well is below freezing, but because it's salty, it ha hasn't quite frozen. But it's cold enough. It's it's like it's like diving in a in a glass full of ice because there's all the ice bits in the water. So it's really cold, and without the right gear, you would only last moments. Um, so we wear dry suits. When I first started ice diving. I wore a wetsuit, just, a, just an ordinary wetsuit. And you couldn't last long, they were cold dives. And I remember pouring hot tea from my thermos down into my suit <laughs> to warm myself up. <laughs> but, but now we wear, we wear these really flashy dry suits where inside the suit, we're wearing good like ski underwear. Mm. Then the suit goes on and you're completely dry, even the gloves are dry. And then you know what, a few years ago, we came up with these heated, vests so we're wearing a vest and, and 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 gloves and they've got wires inside them and a big battery so you you're warm so it's great that we still look a bit heroic andrew we like to look a bit heroic but guess what we're warm and dry <laughs> oh that's um i mean wow i can only imagine how cold it is i personally I'm one of those people where the feeling of cold water on my stomach is like the, <laughs> my least favorite feeling in the world. <laughs> and so it takes me like half an hour to jump into the pool. So I can only imagine. Um, uh, Andrea asks, uh, what has been your favorite animal to dive with? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, for me, I guess it was the six gill sharks. I mean, I've been very fortunate to dive with big whales and, and all kinds of unusual sharks all over the world and creatures. but. There is something about the six gill shark. They're very, most sharks have got five gills on their sides, but there are some very old sort of prehistoric sharks that have got six gills and they're very rare. Um, they've been seen mostly by remote cameras or submarines. And then working for the BBC in the Mediterranean, in between um, uh, Sicily and the Italian mainland is a, is a very deep water coming up quite shallow to about 50 meters. And I had three long complex dives there. And on the last dive, um, managed to bump into a beautiful five meter long six gill shark. And I had about 10 minutes with him. So yes, I shall never forget that dive. Really beautiful, beautiful dive. Yes, so it's hard to pick one because I've been, I've been in the Sea of Cortez and been boomed by the whales when the whales are, they can feel you in the water and sense you and they're sending sound out and you get boom but it's hugely emotional but i guess i'd pick pick my beautiful six gill shark andrew well you know and, and speaking of sharks and whales i just was I'm wondering have you ever during a dive felt unsafe or been in a situation where you were a little bit on the edge of of danger and and can you tell us that story there is something about diving with big things um even even you know even basking sharks which are big long sharks, you know, 35 feet long, and they swim with their mouth open because they're catching all the plankton in the sea. So we know they're just plankton feeders, but when, when they swim towards you and it's the size of a school bus with a big open mouth coming towards you, you can't help but have this human sort of instinct where the heart rate goes up a bit. Um, and even, in, even with, with smaller, but nevertheless carnivorous sharks, when they're all around and they're, they're busy, there's a sense of, wow, we're, we're no longer the top of the food chain. But that's a beautiful feeling because it means we're in pristine waters. But there is still that undeniable sense of your heart rate going up a bit and thinking, holy smokes, I'm swimming around here with 300 sharks. <laughs> Absolutely, wow. I, I mean, can only imagine. I, I hope to one day be able to experience that as well. We have to get you with us, Andrew. We, there must be a way. <laughs> get you on one of our expeditions come on well you know it does it does lead us to the question from from logan uh logan asks if there's any way to intern or to volunteer uh to support the pristine seas project um and so just wanted to see if, if there's anything off the top of your head always yeah we're we're now spending more time uh working remotely and in that remote work you know of course we at the moment we can't travel anywhere until 2021 when we start the expeditions again. So we're working hard with our host countries to help support them in establishing marine protected areas and smart partnerships remotely. So, so yes, I'd say there's always an opportunity for that. Sometimes we've been very lucky because we've, our host country 
And really, we like the host country to lead when we get there. So in the Seychelles, it's the Seychellois who are leading, of course, and in Chile, it's the Chileans, you name it. But um, and we've been very lucky sometimes in not just having senior science teams from that country with us, but we've had students. And it's been brilliant that come and join us. That's a wonderful experience. It's limited a lot by the size of the ship. Um, we, we, you know, ships are expensive, so it depends what we can afford and how the funding is. So sometimes we have a ship that's so small, we can't get our full team on and we have to cut it back. But I would say the smart thing is to write to me, uh, Logan, and I'll keep you informed and, uh, and, and do our best to keep you posted for opportunities because it's something that um, we want to work harder at is engaging uh, opportunities for people to mentor through our project. And you know, I was especially struck, Paul, when you were talking about the, how you have the, the media strategy to help people build affinity with these places, the political strategy to figure out well, which countries are amenable to, to protecting these locations. There's so many different ways, it sounds like, for people to plug into that work. And so it's really generous for you uh, to offer your email address. Absolutely, uh, count on it. We got another question from Paul. The question is just rolling in for you, uh, Paul. Another Paul. Um, he asks, who has had the greatest impact on you in your life? Ah, that's a really great one. I think, firstly, it was a, um, a fictional character called Mike Nelson, who he, he was in, in a television series called Sea Hunt. And um, he was popping up on my television screens when I was about 11 and having really amazing adventures. I mean, I was also watching Jacques Cousteau and Hans and Lottie Hass, who were real underwater heroes. But Mike Nelson was a wonderful guy. He was there in Florida having enormous adventures. And anytime there was a crashed jet in the sea, he went down and rescued the pilot. Or when, the, when there were men in a flooded mine, he'd go and rescue them. And I thought, well, that's for me. I want to be like Mike Nelson. And then when I was 14, uh, a geography teacher at school took my class to Wales, which is um, Western Britain. And we spent two weeks climbing, walking, getting in the rivers, learning to navigate, working as a team. And that experience was the first time I'd really achieved something outside. And I realized I could do it. So Mr. Gray, my geography teacher, all those years ago, yeah, he's the man. That's amazing. And I think there are so many of us who have had a similar situation, a, an impactful teacher or educator in our lives who kind of opened our eyes. And that age 14 feels like it's a sweet spot. Because yeah. I've, I've talked to so many people who their journey in this work or in this world started between the ages of 14 and 17. Some experience exactly. that they had that was very meaningful and that led them to a career. Um, so I really appreciate that, Paul. So the last question I think we have for you today, um, you mentioned earlier that with some of the dive cameras, when you're pulling them up uh, and looking at the images that more than half of the time you're discovering something new. Um, I think a lot of people listening might have been surprised by that statistic. I was kind of surprised by that statistic. Would you mind just talking a little bit more about why that is? And is it really just that there's so much unknown in the oceans that we're just still discovering? It is, it, it is because there's so much unknown. I mean, I remember about 15 years ago, in all of my talks, me and all of my colleagues were saying that we know about 10% of the ocean. And when you think how big this place is, you know, we only know 10%. And then there was a very big uh, multinational, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, uh, I think it, it lasted uh, six years, big global ocean project. And at the end of that project, they discovered so much that we realized we didn't know 10%. We knew about five or 7%. So the more we knew, we realized, ah, oh, we don't know that. And on... And that's the whole ocean, and we know just a tiny percentage of the, what's in the water. So literally, it would be like going to your local park, urban park, throwing a camera over your shoulder, and it would take a picture of something brand new. It'd be crazy, right? But that's what's happening in the ocean. <laughs> I mean, it's so amazing, and it's a, just a, such an incredible reminder that we have of the need to protect these these oceans because there's so much that we don't know that when we are destroying these environments, we're destroying things that we've not even discovered yet. 
Um, and, and it's crazy, Andrew. Some of the things we're learning, I mean, I was reminded only yesterday on a Zoom call that two years ago, we discovered that there's a, a coral reef has a dawn chorus, you know, like bird song, you know. Well, coral reefs have, make, make certain sounds in the morning where, and it, they can tell whether they're healthy or not. And, and wow. certain, certain little tiny beasties move towards healthy sound in corals. We're, we're learning more and more amazing things about the ocean seemingly every five minutes. Yeah. Wow. Well, Paul, we're nearing the end. I think we've got all the questions answered. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking the time. Paul, I know it's a little bit late there where you are, but uh, you really did, like you said, lift the, the hood off the car and, and show us what's happening underneath. And I think, um, you know, the advice that you have is, you know, or urging us to look at the different kinds of careers that are available to you. Um, I, I think that's great advice. And I think a lot of people watching will really take it away. So Paul, thank you so much. And Dane, thank you as well for your help uh, with the Kahoot and, and managing the Kahoot. Um, I think this is a, a great conversation. I hope folks walked away with some learning something new. Fantastic. Um, and Andrew and Dane and the whole team, thanks for putting this all together. It's a great initiative. I, uh, good luck with doing more. And to everybody listening and watching, list, uh, listening and watching thanks for letting me share some, uh, some great stories with you. And I hope to hear from you soon as you move towards conservation careers. Thanks a lot. See you all. See you. Thank you.